this is going to be a fantastic presentation. Mary's work is absolutely phenomenal. She has testimony from thousands of people in the field she works in. She's very, very grounded. She does a methodical research process and she's dotted her I's and crossed her T's. Her work is exceptional. Her commitment to her work is incredible. To be so passionate and dedicated to what she's doing, it's such a huge gift and it's such a huge gift to what she offers to humanity. So it will be quite a revelation in some of the concepts that she'll express to you today and um, buckle up because it will be fascinating. Mary is a, an author. She's already written one book. She has a new book coming out as early as next month called The New Human. She's also a hypnotherapist. She does regression therapy. She's a counsellor. And Mary Rodwell is internationally recognised. She speaks at these kind of events internationally and she's very well known for her respect in the field um, all over the world. And it's a huge gift to have Mary here today and also the fact that she actually lives in Queensland. And that was one of the um, goals of the Paradigm Shift Summit was to have so many amazing people and give a voice to so many amazing people we have here in Australia. So Mary's, Mary's work is pioneering in an incredible way. It's groundbreaking, it's profound in investigating the extraterrestrial phenomenon. She is the founder and principal of the Australian Close Encounters Resource Network. She's a former nurse, midwife and health educator and has been employed previously as a professional counsellor. She's also a hypnotherapist, a metaphysical teacher, researcher, author, Reiki master and international speaker. I could go on and on about Mary, but you don't want to hear me anymore. You want to hear Mary. Please welcome to the stage the Galactic Tribe of Mary Rodwell. Wow. Thank you, Anthony. And I want to say this first. Anthony, if it wasn't for you, then all these beautiful people wouldn't be here right now. So thank you. And all your team and all your team because it's a huge commitment and wow how wonderful thank you so much and I am really really humbled and honored that you're here and you're here because you're ready to hear this otherwise you wouldn't be here and I'm going to take you on a journey and I'm going to make sure that the the time I'm given will at least whet your appetite I'm not asking you to believe any of it or I'm asking for you to listen to your heart and to listen actually to what it's saying as I go through some of this information because I I'm, you know, I'm known for working in ufology, but ufology has to change. And what was wonderful yesterday was Cheryl was showing you a great deal about how many people see craft. One, every six minutes around the globe, somebody sees craft. But that is just the beginning. And the beginning is what's affecting every one of you, whether you've seen a UFO or not. So we're going to start off with this. It is a paradigm shift. And it's time, you all know it's time. It's time for people to wake up and smell the roses. Let's look at it. One of the things that was profound for me was speaking to a lovely gentleman, Mike Oram in the UK, very good friend of mine. And he had experiences right through his life with light beings. And one of the things that struck me from the word go was something he told me that he said to his mother when he was just four years old. And he said this, there will be a change in human consciousness. The energy is headed this way and the essence of this energy is light. The energy will repair our DNA and it will make us complete and who we really are. Now this was at four years old that he said that. And he is one of millions, I believe, around the globe that have this information. And they are sometimes just two, three, four, five, six years old. So this is what's happening now. We are changing and we are evolving, I believe, absolutely. And so what we've got to do is we've got to span that shift from the 3D to the multidimensional. And so we, we've got to create a bridge, really. And the bridge is this. I run the organisation called ACERN, which I started in 1997, which was to support professionally those that have encounters, experiences, whether they see themselves. I'm not getting any sound, guys for whatever reason. There should be some sound or is sound coming? Ah, oh, it's coming, I think. It needs to be a bit louder, perhaps. Can you hear anything? No, it needs to be a bit louder, the sound. Oh, it's a little bit better. I might need the sound a bit louder, actually, for the rest of the... So free is where it's going. 
just about hear it, can't you? So I might need actually more, more sound for someone to help me with that in a minute. Okay, so I'm now part of another organization called FREE, the Foundation for Research into Extraterrestrial Encounters. But it is inclusive of the way that people understand their encounters. Because for most of you, what you've ever been aware of is for those that have had encounters, the bright you know, the bright light coming in the room, being taken somewhere um, to another place, um, being aware of beings around you, etc., etc. Well, for many people, that's not the way it is. For the many, it's, it can be very subtle, and it can happen through a shamanic experience. It can happen through a very deep grief experience. It may happen um, out, by having a spontaneous out-of-body experience. But all of it takes you to this other dimension. So let's start with the extraterrestrial side. Some of you may be aware that Dr. John Mack, who was a, a, pro a professor of psychiatry at Harvard University, wrote two books on this, coming in as a skeptic. And what he discovered, even as a skeptic, after testing many, many people, he discovered that they were quite psychologically sound, but they were having extraordinary human experiences. And this is what he's saying. Extraterrestrial contact is a reality. It's physically happening. It's also some kind of psychological, spiritual experience occurring or originating, perhaps in another dimension. It stretches us, he's saying. It's asking us to be open to realities that are not simply the literal, physical world, but to extend to the possibility that there are unseen realities from which, um, which our consciousness are, if you will, learning processes over the last several hundred years have closed us off. Programming, 3D programming, every one of you has been exposed to it. Isn't it hard then to tell someone that you're sensing beyond that? And this is what we have to change, and this is what we're doing with free. We're actually taking it to science, and we're asking science now to tell us how we can experience things multidimensionally. And so we believe the evidence for the reality is supported scientifically through the quantum hologram of physics and linked to non-ordinary states of consciousness. And this is where we are going and need to go. Dr. Rudy Shield is an astrophysicist and he's an exec uh, executive director of FREE. And this is what he explained to me about the holographic understanding of science. Today we live in an exciting world where advances in space exploration and astrophysics are matched to the wonder of UFO sightings and abductions and deeper human uh, um, space phenomena. Because of the ethereal nature of the data, these developments are not studied by our prestigious universities, largely because of their nature. Well, that has to change. We perceive a need to extend this approach to a larger statistical base with rigorous statistical techniques to expand the discussion and provide a database available to the academic community. Because if we're going to change this, we have to change it right from the bottom up. And this is what you will not get in most of the ufological research up to date because they have not done the surveys to this extent. We're talking between already two to 3,000 individuals that have filled out our first, second, and third, and we've got a fourth survey going even more in depth to the experience. You would be amazed out there how many people are experiencing. And they're doctors, nurses, psychologists, they're policemen, they're pilots, they're astronauts, they're celebrities, they're po politicians. It's everywhere and it's everyone and it's in many families and many children. So we've got 35% that have uh, had a near-death experience and seen these kinds of different intelligences. 80% have had out-of-body experiences with this experience. 61% had an encounter but not an abduction. I'm going to take that in a sense that 25% generally might have felt it was an abduction. And there's an important reason why they feel that. And I want to explain where a lot of this may be. And often it's due to fear. But I'll explain that if I have time. Now this is really, really significant. 85% believe there was a connection between ETs and the spirit world. Pre-birth, post-death. So this takes this very much into the spiritual dimension. For all of you that are coming in thinking, oh, this is about bright lights in the sky, nah, no, I'm sorry, this is not the case at all. This is very much tied into who we are and where we're going in our evolution. 15% experienced soul swapping. So what's that? That 
that's meaning that you can go into another container and, and I'm going to tell you about a little boy of eight years old that told me one of his experiences is when he goes on the craft is when he actually will move in. He said, like, I evaporate into the mantid form, which is his family, by the way, these huge beings that look like mantid, uh, praying mantis. And he said, they're family. And when I die, that's where I'm going back to my family again. This is an eight-year-old boy telling me this. 82% believe there's a connection between ETs and reincarnation. There are people uh, that have said to me they've had encounters in other lifetimes and children that have talked about being on other planets in their other lifetimes. But the most significant, and this is not what you're going to get on the media or in the films and, and documentaries and all the rest of it because this is scary, isn't it? Sorry, that's not what our research is showing. And this is the biggest turnaround of all. 85% undergone major positive transformation. They are more spiritual, less materialistic, and they have a concern for the environment, and many of them become healers. <laughs> that's the kicker. So, okay. How is free different to many of these other organizations that I've mentioned? And many of them, you know, have been around long, a long time, maybe too long. Let's listen to this. <laughs> Ufology is nuts and bolts, and I understand why. We've needed to look at it from a 3D perspective. Of course, we, we've had to do this. And people, when they're questioning their experience, need to know there's a tangible reality. And that's extremely important because we live in a 3D reality, too. So photographs are important, video footage, you know, um, that Damien, for example, and, and Cheryl talked about, really, really important as researchers. Sightings from credible witnesses. Who are credible? That's, that's a moot point, isn't it? <laughs> Implanted objects, marks and scars which fluoresce under black or vi ultraviolet light. Whistleblower testimony, which you have to be a little bit wary of because you don't know whether that's been planted anyway, but, you know, it's still valuable. Military and political disclosure, whenever that will be. Missing time episodes are really crucial and they have been in my work because when I'm, somebody's coming to me and they've lost two hours on a journey to see Auntie Jane and Auntie Jane says, well, where have you been for the last two hours because it should have only taken half an hour, then you can explore that and you can find out what happened through hypnosis. Magnetic changes in the soil are really important and also conscious recall. But there's something very important about conscious recall. You're only allowed to remember what you're allowed to remember. So where does free go? Well, we go into all the weird and the wonderful and it's about time. Out of body experiences, we are looking into that. And uh, you know, in my new book, that's, ex that's a whole chapter on someone who spends most of their time out of body. What do they experience? How do they experience it? Near-death near experiences, very profound and can be the catalyst for people, as some of you I'm sure have read the books, how it's changed their life on every level, their perspective, how they see the world, they feel more connected to everything, all those transformative sides through their near-death experience. Healing during encounters. How many of you realize that 50% of people are healed when they go um, and they're taken on board craft and having profound healing? Healing where, you know, they've had chronic illnesses or they could have died. Not, you don't hear about this, do you? Heightened intelligence. How some have come back and found that they understood physics or they've understood some other um, subject that they'd never ever studied before. Information, knowledge, downloads, advanced physics. Heightened multidimensional senses such as telepathy, clairvoyance, past life recall both on Earth and other planets, telekinesis moving objects with the mind. The children tell me some amazing stories about that, but so do the adults. Transformative changes in perspective, holistic lifestyles and attitude, expressions through scripts, artwork, languages, light languages. All of this happens. Where's the evidence? There's the evidence. You don't start doing strange scripts and you don't start speaking a strange language because you just feel like it. It happens because it's related to this. Shamanic types of experiences, and there's a whole range of them that people, you know, Kundalini awakening. All of this is relevant to this because it takes us into our multidimensional state. And the multidimensional nature of DNA itself, how many of you know that? Let's take us to that. But first, have they been here? They've been here forever. They're part of who we are. We're hybrids. And there's so much evidence now to tell you that. Here's just one 
and if you want to go into it, please go into it. This one here is about Akhenaten. Look at the shape of the skull there. Look at how interesting that is in itself. Akhenaten's DNA apparently suggests he had higher cranial capacity because of the need to house a larger cortex. What is that saying? The, uh, it's interesting the pharaohs always said they were sons of gods. Well, the gods were the ETs. The gene called CXPAC-5, responsible for cortex growth, suggests an anomaly which is visible in the image below. So they're already discovering these anomalies in some of the um, artifacts they're finding now in, in archaeology. Here's another one. And, and again, where is the evidence? The evidence is in front of you. Look for it. Akhenaten's bone dense, dense, is denser and fundamentally different to the right normal bone in a similar mummy. So here we have at least one. What else are you not being told? Plenty. Here's just an example of it. Go and look and find out for yourself. What was wonderful about Dr. Francis Crick, who was one of the co-founders of the um, understanding of the DNA molecule, <coughs> and conclu uh, he concluded extraterrestrial genes in the human genome in his book Life Itself. What's fascinating is what he's saying here. The DNA molecule is the most efficient information storage system in the entire universe. The immensity of complex, coded, precisely sequenced information is staggering. The DNA evidence speaks of intelligent, information-bearing designs. So that's the important bit. DNA functions like letters in a, uh, uh, letters in a written language or symbols in a computer code. This is very important because I'm going to explain where the light language may be going. They program the molecules so that when we reached a certain level of intelligence, we would be able to access their information and they could therefore teach us about ourselves and how to progress. For life to form by chance, it's mathematically virtually impossible. Let's just look at that. What have they already found? Do you think they found everything in DNA? No, they're just starting. 50 years of DNA research turned upside down because scientists discover a second programming language in genetic code. There's a hidden code and a second code which contains information that alters how scientists read instructions in DNA and interpret mutations. This is just the beginning of us understanding what we're made of. This second code has a different language. So what is that all about? We're a design species. A whistleblower geneticist in the book The Intervention Theory um, but was written by Lloyd Pye. Some of you may know about the star, star child skull found in Mexico that he did DNA testing on over a number of years and discovered that it's, um, the mother's mitochondrial DNA literally was not human. But the whistleblower himself in a letter at the, uh, at the end of this book is saying by certain methods of DNA dating one can tell numerous genes have been recently added to the human genome. And that is apart from the 223 genes that are in our DNA that a scientist who worked with Dr. Crick, who I met in Adelaide, said to me, Mary, there is no other species on this planet that has those 223 genes, and they're all to do with higher psychological functioning. Really, really important. And so this whistleblower is saying this, if colleagues in my field were to say such things openly, we would be ostracized and forced to live in a tent. Any work along these lines would be rejected without any form of appeal. So what, do we, what can we do? This is what you're not being told. And this is why you need to do your own research and find out for yourself what is going on. But the most fascinating part of DNA that I've discovered, and it was by scientists in Russia, and they used linguists, they used a whole range of disciplines, and what they discovered this, was this. DNA follows the regular grammar and set rules of human language. Human languages did not appear coincidentally, but are a reflection of our inherent <coughs> DNA. Human language can actually alter the nature of DNA and its frequency. Human language will interact with living DNA. They react to the language modulated laser rays and to radio waves if the proper frequencies are used. Why do you think you know, um, different types of frequencies work, meditation, etc.? subliminal information. Why do you think it works? Because it's affecting our DNA. This explains affirmations and hypnosis. It has such a powerful effect on human bodies. It really does work. It isn't your imagination and you all know that. Both positive and negative information will affect you on every level. 
And to give you an example of this, there's a lovely um, bit of information I came across in recent times. And this is a lovely gentleman, Luther Burbank, who was a botanist, and he was a pioneer in agricultural science. And this is what he discovered. He said, the secret of improved plant breeding is love. And he changed the structure of hundreds of plants, including fruit and vegetables. And he worked on some cactus with spines. And he actually sent, said to them, you don't need to protect yourself from me. I'm not going to hurt you. And he ended up growing cactus without spines. That was in the 1930s, guys. Okay. We're multidimensional. How are we multidimensional? Human DNA apparently produces magnetized wormholes to transmit information from outside space and time, a biological internet. Very, very interesting that they discovered that this, they, we function apparently like a holographic computer using endogenous DNA ra laser radiation are able to modulate certain frequency patterns into laser ray and influence DNA frequency and thus genetic information itself. So what we're actually able to do, if you like, each um, part of our DNA really is like a miniature wormhole. And when you have intuition, when you have clairvoyance, where you sense things or whatever, you are tapping into the matrix and you're doing it through your DNA because of its holographic nature. Which of course explains everything from precognitive insights, clairvoyance, intuition, telepathy, past lies, remote hacks of healing, self-healing, remote influencing, weather patterns. And just a little aside to that, I was talking to an eight-year-old um, only a couple of weeks ago in the US and she said, I said, what kind of gifts or abilities do you ha have? And she said, well, mine's the elements. So I said, what do you mean? She said, both the wind and the clouds, I can influence them. That is my, one of my abilities. This is an eight-year-old in the US. So if she can do it, so can we. Let's look at this. Human DNA has the ability to, to transform. The genes have all the characteristics of genes, but on another level, they contain information of their origin with tools to transform to a higher form. The information of the donors and their background is there, a hidden key, and like PC programmers hide their work. The key can be activated and these programmers know when the person is ready to be contacted. So if you've not had it yet, it's you, them waiting for you to be ready. The activated ones spread a signal to wake others up. I feel they, the beings, are speeding this up. So even by being here, whether you feel you're activated or not, it's going to change the way you see the world. And I'm taking no responsibility for that, by the way. <laughs> so if you don't want to be changed, the door's there. Okay. Now, this comes from somebody who I know very well now, Dr. Lena Olson. She is a molecular biologist, um, a scientist, and she's also an experiencer. And I'm going to quote her a few times because of her information is extremely useful and valuable in, in what we're talking about. So, I'm going to leave the science behind a little bit as we move forward. I wanted to give you a baseline. So here we have scientific research that suggests human DNA has physical and multidimensional properties. It contains anomalies and complexities. So what does this mean? What is the evidence for Homo sapiens and our ancestors were intelligent and designed? Well, we've, we've give, I've given you an example of that. Arcanatan, whistleblower material, research demonstrating that at least two levels of information are in our DNA. DNA operates multidimensionally through miniature wormholes. It's programmable through human language, frequency. Epigenetics, by the way, is another way we get it programmed. And all of you, through education, through your, you, you know, your families and what have you, through beliefs, are also part of this. And that is affecting the very cell itself. It's applicable to all species. We've, we've discovered that through plants. It's the ability to transform itself and affect others through frequency. So what impact is there on DNA VR extraterrestrial programmers in encounters with them? This is an important one because I, I didn't realize when I participated in this particular thesis how relevant it would be in later years, and I'm absolutely convinced of it now. Simon Harvey Wilson in uh, Western Australia, he's no longer with us, sadly, a wonderful researcher, and he did this thesis with, the, um, with a CERN, some of my clients, 
And what he discovered when he was looking at the comparison between shamanism and, and abductions demonstrated these parallels. That in fact, it was the same. Transcending fear. Anyone who is working with the shamanic way of, under, of, of awakening or moving forward knows that you have to transcend your human fears to operate in a multidimensional reality. What does the UFO type experience do? Exactly the same thing. It's about transcending fears and going beyond that to be in a place where you can operate and communicate with the family. And you know what I mean by the family, because we all come from there. Transcending fear, healing abilities, present and past lives with ETs, telepathic abilities, changes in perception. Identical. It's the modern day way of waking up. Time to come out of the space closet, as I call it. <laughs> This is Dr. Olson, and this is why she did this and why she has been so courageous. Because in Sweden, quite honestly, it's, it's a very closed society to this kind of thing. Amazingly courageous lady. And this is what she's saying is why she came out of the closet. I consider the Manta to be my friends and the first time I saw them without their disguise. The guidance and help I'm receiving, I know it's important for me to stay alive, evolving and developing my abilities because I feel great changes are coming in my lifetime. Six months ago, she had a strange healing experience and why she's telling her story. I asked for guidance to know if I was on track and if I should come out and give me a sign. Immediately, I had, she said, I had severe dislocation of my atlas vertebra which caused extreme discomfort. Spontaneously, it rotated by itself into the correct position. I can now swallow without pain. That is what I call my sign, and I'm coming out as promised. And this kind of thing is happening everywhere. People are being activated and awakening, and it's been happening over the last few years in um, an exponential way. Let's take it a little bit more. This is what some of the things Dr. Olson has experienced. And this is the whole panorama now we're talking about, not just seeing lights in the sky or feeling you might have been taken somewhere. There is so much more that's going on. Um, what she's saying here is she's encountered many species of extraterrestrial beings, interdimensionals. She's experienced near-death experiences, out-of-body experiences, path life recall, shamanic experiences. <laughs> Healing experiences both as a healer and being healed by non-human intelligences. Her intuitive understanding of the new human upgrades, the letter people she calls them, Asperger's, ADHD, dyslexia and some types of autism. And I know that's going to rattle some cages and I, 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 I hope it does. So multidimensional abilities and scientific and intuitive understanding of loading and energizing water. Water really being extremely important. So let's look at that. These are the types of intelligences. Look at the Look at the list. All the different ones, and I have spoken to so many that it's not, you know, the little beings. The, the ones that most people see are humanoid. 50% see humanoid beings. Not little greys, not the other, other ones that you hear and see so much on the telly. So Ramtar is this wonderful being here. And she said, he told her he was there to keep her safe and protected when she came out with her story. The connection's a long-standing one. She deals with intelligences from the Andromeda ga galaxy, a gold monk, Buddha being, fairy pixie beings, water spirit, Native American guardian, shadow people, blue orbs, water spirits, a small brown flat skull beings during healing, eagle man, avatar human who was solid and met her on a train once when she was in a very bad place, Cat being, le leopard being, mantid being, and various spirits. Now, I bet there's probably most of you have had some interaction with something that may fit into this category here. So welcome to the club. <laughs> so let's take it a little bit further. The 12 old guys that teach me. The 12 old guys coming to guide me and teach me different things in a kind of shamanic way with feelings, pictures, energy, orbs, abductions, but also letting me experience different tests, almost failing, dying, but in the last moment helping me to solve the problem. We've come here to learn. We've come here to be challenged. If it's, not, if it's going too easy, you're not learning a great deal, are you? The challenges are when you grow. You all know that. They're the ones to help me understand. I have conversations when I'm awake and in meditation. This is an interesting one. This is a 2.5 meter amphibian healing with a knee injury when she was 16 years old. 
bright white light in the room. I saw a hole in the wall with a large room like a laboratory. So you've got a portal here. Um, people with white lab coats and other beings. Huge box-like object, like an aquarium from this room, moved over the lower part of my legs and covered me on the sides. Inside this energy box contained blue energy light. It was so strong it radiated out and was being filled up with white swirling silvery smoke. And suddenly, there was a green hand with larger scales on the back of the arm, five green fingers, much longer than humans, nails like claws, a little finger that was webbed, feet like frog's feet, a voice saying, they show me this so I won't be afraid. I asked mentally, why are you doing this? The answer was, because you have our DNA. I blacked out and awoke with my whole body vibrating. Two hours later, my body felt strange and my feet felt like they were standing on air there was none of the intense pain I felt while walking. The arch of my foot was normal. All pain and inflammation was gone. This is a wake-up call. Wow. So the cone heads, she's had lots of interaction with them. And she said, I was one of these beings in a past life. Now, this is the important thing here. This takes us to beyond our physical human experience. This takes us to where we're from, our origins which may be anywhere in this galaxy or galaxies or multidimensionally in other dimensions. It can be any of those that we've all come in at the moment for a human experience. Here we've got evidence. You've got it quite easily. Oh, hold on a minute, I'm going back again. Let me, that's it. Here we go. So what we've got here, as you can see, skulls that are found all over the world. And what's interesting is that they tried to tell us that this was due to binding by primitive tribes who may have tried to emulate that, that particular form for sure until they actually found skeletons with fetuses with the same shaped heads. So it makes it very hard then to say. <laughs> Cone heads are with these beings. I was describing the healings. And this is from Queensland. A lady there who described the identical images that you're seeing here. And that's Dr. Olson's picture here. I'm trying not to do, press the wrong thing here. This is the cone-headed being. You can see the same thing here. And what was interesting, and I do it all the time, is if I get something like that, then I will cost, um, see if I can get corroboration from someone else who's had similar experiences. And it was identical. And what was fascinating was all these symbols that Heather had done when I showed them to Dr. Olson, she actually recognized some of the symbols. And this is where it becomes really compelling. I'm going to take you into the orb phenomena because I expect there's quite a few around in this room right now, um, to explain a little bit more about what this is saying to us in terms of our reality. Healing is connected to the orbs, by the way, and this particular one is from a researcher, Grant Cameron, in Canada. And this particular orb, they actually observed and filmed it going inside the body of this particular gentleman. And afterwards, the large tumour disappeared that he had and was experiencing. So this orb was one of the healing orbs. But there are many others, and I'm going to go a little bit more into that by showing you this. When I was working with a family, the whole family had been taken up onto a craft, grandma, mum and two, her two sons, I met them in the Lake District and the 15 year old was um, going to have a session with me as, long, as well as his grandmother who had been very scared. And I think he'd wished he'd, you know, went to school that day at first because he was a bit worried about what on earth this strange lady was going to do um, it, with him. It was an amazing session with him for one reason, was once he went into the altered state, he was having his own chats to the beings. And one of the things he was saying, and he was, this was recorded, is why me? Oh, I chose to do it. I volunteered to come back. I chose to do this. The two greys, they're still with me. They told me to stay on track. Oh, I've been on Earth 27 times. And he said, and the grey beings, when they arrived in my garden, I can see orbs, whitey gold and two smaller ones. And they're here to make me feel warm and their family. And then he explains, because I asked him, I said, you know, um, the big one, he says, is great Nana. And the other one's Nana's dad, grandfather and granddad's brother. They're here to make me feel comfortable and to reassure me. So I asked him how he knew what the orbs of light were. I just knew. I asked why were they there for him? And he said, 
They've come with the greys to support me, to make me feel comfortable so I wouldn't be frightened. John then said that when the greys left, the orbs of light went into the spacecraft with them. So here we have the connection the, uh, in terms of the spirits that are interacting and part of this whole dimensional realm that we want to separate out and say, oh, well, the spirit's on one, one level and the ETs are on another and whatever. No, sorry. No, it doesn't work like that. It's all part of the multidimensional um, experience. Near-death experiences, many people have them and it, it always is profound. This is Dr. Olson's and she said this. Um, she'd actually suffering from septicemia. The doctors thought she was going to die in Sweden and basically they'd more or less given up hope. She had this near-death experience and she said in the experience every bit of colour lifted from my body and when it came to my heart and head instantaneously all pain left and everything went dark. I felt happy, loved, something I'd never felt before. I thought of my kids and I could stroll back and forward in this tunnel with photos of them. The photos looked more like separate and intense as I went into them and I could check up on thoughts and feelings of the children that they had and, and if they were doing okay. I could barely discern the night sky and stars and experience an overwhelming feeling of love and belonging and shh, I was back and then my brain blanked out and I woke much later and I had a terrible ache in my whole body and I thought, oh no, I'm back and started to cry because she knew she'd come here to do something. So this was really fascinating. The doctors agreed it was a miraculous re recovery. She was instantly healed from massive sepsis and her organs were undamaged, which was medically impossible. Six months after this, she experienced high strangeness, perceived auras, energies around people, see through solid objects. And I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, um, what was interesting was this 12-year-old um, boy saying to his father, who was an engineer, Dad, when you're doing things on the computer at work, what is it you're doing when you're doing these certain things? Because I'm, I can see what you're seeing. And he got his father to explain to him actually what he was doing on the computer. This is the awareness of these children. They can send their consciousness and they can perceive things elsewhere. But getting back to this, she is able to see through solid objects. And this is one of the abilities of a lot of these children. She can encounter spirits and know when someone's lying and uh, uh, also sharing messages. The most cherished encounters, now this is important, the most cherished encounters are with extraterrestrials, both as visitors, teachers and healing, healers. What does that say? This is not what you're hearing. So, we can be reprogrammed by frequency, human language. So what does that mean? We know that it's not just DNA is not just responsible for the construction of the body, but is uh, a data storage in which, which in communication follows the rules of language, just requires the right frequencies. So what we're hearing really is that affirmations, the way we speak to one another, literally affects us. You know that old saying, sticks and stones will break my bones but words will never hurt me? It's actually the other way around. I think you all know that. So if language can alter DNA, what effect does light language, star language have? And why do people start spontaneously coming out with it? What does it mean? Because this is part of the evidence. And I'm going to show you a couple of clips. I'm going to keep an eye on the, the time here. Right. I was told this lady, a lovely uh, Emma Strong uh, uh, from the US, I was only 22% humanoid and the rest is a form of light energy. When I speak in star languages, I feel I'm giving directives to angels. Every time I take a video from my phone, it records spacecraft. I can be gone for hours. Recently, I woke up with tree material in my hair. I'd not left the house since I washed it. <laughs> I believe I'm traveling at night to different dimensions, times my actual physical body goes, not just my soul. And this is the outer body where you're actually in that reality. It's not like remote viewing. It is distinctly different. In 2009, I was awoken once or twice at night between 1 and 3. How many of you wake up at a certain time at night? You may relate to this. I can only describe it as similar to a rush of adrenaline, an electric current going through my body. Once I woke myself up by speaking another language. I have now numerous cases where people have said, my husband in the night starts having this dialogue, this, speaking this strange language, maybe two or three, and I've even got recordings of them. So something is going on, on another level, 
and this is what we need to look at. So have a look at this and I want you to see how um, while Emma is speaking you can see the orbs that are in the room getting very very excited because Emma's doing that. I hope you can hear the language. You can see the orbs already, look. Can you see them? <laughs> oh, you're not seeing it very well. I don't know if you can see them or not. You're not seeing any of the orbs, are you? I don't know why that is. I wish I could show you my screen, guys. Right, well I'm going to talk you through this one. You'll have to believe me on this one and trust me. What's happening is the, all the orbs are actually going backwards and forwards and what have you. The whole time she's speaking. Um, which is a, a shame. But you all know what orbs look like, don't you? Okay, I'm sorry it's so dark but I can't explain that one. So what's happening here is that she's having an interaction at the same time she's speaking the language. That's just one of them. Now, I think this is actually something I've shown you a couple of a couple of slides ago. I'm going to actually show you the healing encounter with the cone head that was. Um, I thought this was in another place, but I've got it in the wrong place. So this will give you an idea of Lena's healing with the cone head. I woke up staring right into the oh, lower dear. body of the Can't small see it either. I raised my head and upper body from the bed and leaned my head into my right hand. Immediately I focused my eyes on places it's too in the dark. room and wondered what this being looked like. I left my body and went to those places in above and behind the being. I could see my body from above, felt so happy, and then I slowly lowered myself down into my body. When I was back and in control of my body, I leaned forward towards the being. He was still standing, healing me with his eyes shut, and I could see the soft glow from the fabric in his suit and every fiber in it. That's the experience of, um, and this is what she's saying, the room had a green and yellow haze. She focused on the being from his forehead was a white beam. It made a 90 degree angle over his hands and his, his body. He had a tight, light, silvery, bluish, slim suit and boots of the same color. Notice that, that she's got a lot of detail here. And that in itself gives you an authenticity to the story. And she said in it re rotated very fast. But what we're hearing is, is light and frequency used to do healing, which many of you that are doing you know, various types of mantras or toning or, or whatever, um, all of these are different ways to bring in the frequencies to shift and change the nature and, uh, of the molecules of who you are, including the DNA. And for those of you that want to know a little bit more about that, both these DVDs have in them the, the light languages and also have a young lady called Rochelle Diela who's doing healing with the light languages as well. But what I'd like to show you now is, um, and I'm hoping you can see it, it's a, unfortunately a little bit dark. Emma's showing you how she's doing the script and how she needs to hold her hand to write the script. And for some of you, you know, it may look very strange, but what I seem to understand from this now is as you get activated, as you wake up, you're tapping into more of who you are. And that's not just the homo sapien sapien side of you, but the other parts of the extraterrestrial DNA that you're tapping into, whether it's Pleiadian or Arcturian or whatever it is, you're actually tapping into more of who you are from those frequencies. So I'll just, I'm hoping you can see it. If not, we will move on. I'm going to try to hold this camera oh, you'll like see this, it. but it'll be shaking and moving. But I don't know how else to get the whole picture in. But this is me writing. And I don't, don't meditate or anything. It just comes in. I get sent files of these kinds of script, not just from adults, but from children. And it looks very strange, it looks like shorthand, but what they tell me is that each one of those symbols, if you saw it multi-dimensionally, would fill a room with encyclopedias. 
It's compressed files of information. You're just seeing it two-dimensionally there and you're thinking, oh, it looks a bit weird. But actually, it is information and she's saying that it's actually going into the matrix itself, as she'll explain, and she explains it beautifully in terms of understanding. I have talked to those that have been up on the craft. One particular lady told me that when she was taken to her home planet on the craft, she was shown this script and she understood this script. So it seems to be something that we're getting from that other level of awareness, our other travels, when we're no longer in body or yeah, from our here we go. My hand more support, so I write it in this direction. And she explains how she needs to hold it. It matters to them where it stops and where it ends because like I said, um, like I told before, it tends to um, <clears throat> it uh, goes someplace once I get it down on paper and I don't think it matters if I tear up the paper, apparently the writing or what is said in the writings always going to be. It just is and it's already recorded. It's almost sort of backhand and it sort of has changed over the years. Um, but that's the writing. See, it more or less goes that way or that way. And they put a lot of dots. For some reason I'm dotting things in there and I'm not quite sure why that is unless there's extra emphasis or it's like I don't know that it could be a period at the end of the sentence, but anyway, that's my writing, and I do have to hold the pen sometimes more or less, it's easiest to hold it like this, because I have more, if I were to write like this, you have to move like this, and that's not how they're grabbing it. They're wanting to use my whole, a lot more of this, rather than this sort of thing. And it gives me better control, because it seems like they grab the pen and um, it just is taking control of, but I can't tell if it's like perhaps an outside source or if it's actually just me, my higher self doing it. Okay. She art art articulates it absolutely beautifully and this is the same kind of information that I'm receiving from others that do similar script. And believe me, I've got files of this. This is not unusual. It, in fact, I played some language which you're going to hear in a minute from De Deborah Lapatina and she does it really beautifully. When I played the light language I had... As singing the frequencies are an integral part of the transmission. These languages carry billions of bits of information in a bridge format. Human language is linear. Speaking, singing, light language feels like spiral and wave-like. Sensation of being awash with layers of knowing that is understood but cannot be articulated in a linear word string. Advanced beings use telepathy or direct thought transference. This is some of her script. Again, it's fascinating to see the different symbols, and I, again, I have many that are very similar to that. But have a listen to um, the way that she speaks the light language. <laughs> I've got many examples and some of it actually really affects me more than others and I need to also understand why certain frequencies affect me that the way that they do. And, and the other thing that was profound for me is wow, certain languages, I'll have people write to me who've heard one of the languages on the presentation or on the DVDs and say, Mary, 
I've been speaking that language all my life and I never knew where it was from and they will be really, really emotional and very touched by this. So there is something very profound in those frequencies and these light languages. And also what's interesting is some, um, some gentlemen I've spoken to actually can dialogue with one another with these languages and one of them uh, contacted me and he actually spoke Lemurian to me which was fascinating because of course that was one of the earlier earth languages and I'm pretty certain that our languages ultimately came from where we came from or at least from our, uh, our um, non-human ancestors if you like. But now I'm going to uh, step up a bit. I'm going to take you to where we're going and this is the new human evolving species, as Dr. Lena Olson calls them, a quantum letter people. And I'm going to explain why she calls them that, because she says herself that she is one of them. And this is how she describes it. The programs such as ADD, ADHD, Asperger's letter people. I do not believe they're broken genes, but instead offering a new multi-dimensional skills to prevent limited reprogramming of a third dimensional reality. It's not so simple as foreign DNA. It's a combination of genetically improved bodies in combination with souls from different places in our universe, incarnating in these improved bodies. The souls have different frequencies, vibrations, depending on their evolutionary status, and that plays a role in activation of the DNA in that particular body. I believe we also have to take into account the collective soul of Homo sapiens. So this is way beyond looking at this from 3D. This is looking on really who we are. Um, from, from the spiritual soul perspective. And here, let's take it to this level here. This is how she explains her understanding of herself as a letter person. And she's done the tests on herself, and this is what, how she expl explains it. She has above normally sensor sensory cells for pressure in her skin. She can hear above and below the normal range of hearing. How many of you, I wonder, are sensitive to sound? I expect a few in here. Aware of minute differences in the shades of color than normal because they can see almost um, in a, with a synesthesia which is supposed to be very strange and where, where you know, you're seeing colours in forms or whatever. I wonder how many of you in this room actually experience that. This is where we're going. Taste and smell are enhanced, sensitive to all frequencies and would feel overwhelmed at times by sensory overload. I'm sure that affects many of you here. Sensitivity to radioactive radiation, energy fields and energies beaming out from angry people as well as love and happiness. If we can learn how to focus and control our own energy field, we would be less prone to get ill from our surroundings. We can use our own self-healing abilities. This is the letter people. And this is very interesting here because Tracy Taylor I've mentioned many, many times. I, I first was introduced to her when she was in her early 20s. She really thought that she was going crazy. She was assessed ultimately by eight psychiatrists who ultimately said to her they didn't think there was anything wrong with her, um, even though she told them about all the beings that she was seeing and, and the images she was drawing. But I valued her information because I felt the authenticity of it. And this is what she told me about the new humans. This is in before 2000. The conscious awareness of these new babies is increasing to override dominant conditioning and programming that occurs at birth with new children. The DNA of the new human has tenfold the amount of information, such things as telepathy, manipulation of time and space, and non-verbal communication are all conscious abilities, and it's natural. Learning skills and abilities are more advanced. Their molecular structure allows the cells of the body to vibrate faster than anything, accelerated, including the immune systems. And she's not the only one, which is what was really heartening for me when I spoke to Dr. William Brown in 2010 and I asked him from being a molecular biologist if he had any understanding of this. And this is what he said. I believe genetic modification is occurring right now in utero is actually producing new humans. The new genetic architecture allows them to see the world in multi-dimensional fashion. I believe dormant genetic regions are being integrated into the biological systems and occurring in all of us to produce expanded awareness. It's happening to everyone. The exponential increase in ADD, autistic and indigo children, their brains work faster, they already know what they're being taught. 
The intrinsic understanding of knowledge and information operates at biomolecular level. It's transgenerational information. We're tapping into it the more we are activated. It's encoded within the atomic structure of the DNA molecule. It can be accessed more efficiently to produce savant-like characteristics. The modification of the DNA is more like remodeling of the genome to make dormant regions accessible again. And the hybrids are altogether a new species. So, if we're only using a tenth of our brain uh, abilities, if we're only using 90, 95%, uh, sorry, 5% of 95% of our DNA, what's the rest for? What is, it, it actually ha what is actually happening now as we evolve? What is going on with those parts of us that have not yet been accessed? That's the question. What I love about Neil Gold is a, a wonderful researcher in, in um, Hong Kong who I went over there to see. He wrote a book called Close Encounters of the ADHD Kind. And the reason he did that was he found only in his 50s that he was this ADHD, he had no idea that there was a label for what he'd experienced of reality. And this is how he explained it, and this is why we have to look at this whole thing about these so-called dysfunctions. He said, as an ADHD, I was always dialed into higher dimensions. That's the term it is. That's the term. My internet browser can browse into chaos be it on Earth or in the multiverse, I can perceive hidden layers of order and make sense of it. I'm not limited to the square template of the universe, I'm wired into a multi-dimensional universe. That is the difference, and that is why they're different. They're not dysfunctional, they're the upgrade. We're the dysfunctional ones because we're still trying to get there. I spoke to a 10-year-old who told me that six or seven he was downloading formulas to create portals. A wonderful young man that went to his teachers and he said to his teachers, you know, you teach in a linear fashion, I think in spirals. <laughs> ten. Ten years old. And he told me that he came through a portal in the sun. Well, let's have a look. Oh, hold on a minute. We haven't got there. I'm there and you're not. Here we go. Look at this, this is the sun. What are these objects coming out of the sun? Have a look, have a look for yourself. They're images and the, and the sun and there's the corona. What are these images coming out? Many of the children born these days have memories intact from their previous existence on board craft as extraterrestrials. They are kept on track by continuing their interaction with their cosmic family while they're still in human form. So these are images just to say what is the sun? Many now believe it is a portal as we're going to go into what the children know. This is a, a lovely story um, and it's intergenerational because the father who wrote to me is an engineer and he said this about his son. Um, he told him that he came from Andromeda. He said he had a mother with blue skin, the language was thought forms with telepathy. He's even asked me to explain what I was doing at work because he couldn't understand the computer code I was writing at the time. He feels he can read people's minds and it can be scary. Well, I can relate to that one. <laughs> what was interesting, only recently I had an email from a, a lady who told me a three-year-old daughter was telepathic and literally was reading everyone's minds and it was becoming really difficult for her because she said, have you ever tried to monitor your thoughts 24-7, Mary? It isn't easy. So this isn't about saying a swear word, you know. This is about what you're thinking. That's a lot harder. So this is what we're, we're dealing with. These are the new kids and this is why you know, I'm getting more and more passionate about providing the understanding or at least encouraging people to understand more of what's going on with their children. And again, what is he? ADHD. No surprise there. Um, this is something else. He had past life recall of Andromeda. He said, um, I can do... Now, this was particularly interesting to me because I love all these extra little bits and pieces. Here, we've got some anomalies um, on the moon. Did you know there's a pyramid on the moon, by the, by the way? And here's another one here. What Peter said was this. I can do great things. Something amazing happened before I died. We left something on the moon to help Earth. I was sent to help. He, and of course, seeing the anomalies on the moon, which Ed, Edward, was, his father, was seeing, said um, he asked his son if there was a machine lo located there which worked with consciousness. This goes into the very interesting side of things, both biological and me me mechanical. 
Was it accurate? Because he'd read somewhere there was technology on the moon. And Peter immediately answered yes. And his father said, was this certitude from his past life recall or not? He didn't know. And this is something else, some of the children telling me, that there are bases on the moon and there are beings under the surface and they've seen them. And this is a number of children now and I'm going to take you to that. But what is interesting here is conf confirmation. Isn't it lovely when you get the confirmation? This gentleman here, Carl Worfs, worked with Tactical Air Command um, in Langley Air Force Base. Working at NASA, sorry, NSA, Wolf witnessed photographs taken by the lunar orbiter of the moon that showed clearly detailed artificial structures of domes, mushroom-shaped buildings and towers. These photos were taken prior to the Apollo landing in 1969. He said, I remember going home thinking, I can't wait to hear about this on the evening news. And here it is 30 years later. No surprise, guys. Something big is on the moon. Okay, and the children know it. Here's another one. This is, a, this is a lovely young man. His awareness, every time I spoke to him, blew me away. He lives in the US and told me about what he understood about himself as a hybrid, etc. Um, reality, um, how he understood why they've come. And he actually told me about his past life on Mars. And he said there's been wars on Mars with various groups of ex extraterrestrials. And I asked him, he said, I can build an interstellar craft. And I said, well, is this a download? Is this what you're taught on the spacecraft or whatever? He said, oh, no. He said, this is my past life. I just remember how to do it. And this is what I'm talking about. It is as real and it is available to these children because it is conscious. This is not unconscious information. And this is why I think it's... Um, fabulous. Some of you may know of Bariska. He's been around a while. Um, this young man, um, even when he was two or three years old, was talking about the cosmos. He was naming different universes, etc., etc. Um, and what was fantastic for me in terms of corroboration, he also said that he used to fly craft from Mars to Earth and there was a race called the Lemurians and he interacted with them. And these are, this is a, um, one of the skeletons being found, which he said the Lemurians were nine meters tall. Okay, so here we, again, look at this. Go and have a look for yourself. It really is fa fantastic. But he said also that there are the indigos coming to change things. He said a great deal more. Look him up. He's a very interesting young man. He was actually interviewed for Project Camelot, um, but he's, you know, there's a lot of other information that translated from the Russian about this young man. But I'm going to take you to another bit of the rabbit hole. I'm going to have to be fast because I want to get this in. Um, just to give you some idea, I've had at least two girls from the US, both about seven or eight, that have talked about being taken on spacecraft to Mars, seeing the domes on Mars, Here's her dome that she saw on Mars. Here's a real dome on Mars, taken by Mars Rover, by the way, just so that you can see. These are the mantid beings that she, this is one is very special, she said. Her mother drew this one because her mother sees the mantid ones as well. And she's saying this particular alien, this one here, you can't see it very, very well there, is important because he's very different to the gray aliens. The grey aliens don't need clothes because, they're species, because of their species of aliens. The green alien is rare, it doesn't talk at all. The grey ones talk all the time, the domes can be black or white. And she goes into more. Um, the, the school was on Mars. Oh sorry, I'm going to go back again. Oh, I'm going, oh well, there we go, there we go. The school was on Mars, we don't learn anything we learn on Earth. Seven year old young girl. The aliens who fed her were nice, they spoke telepathically. She learnt paranormal skills and saw babies in a crib and aliens of various ages. She interacted with a teenage alien in this school and said she learnt the most from her. When she returned, the aliens cloaked their craft so we couldn't see them. Now this is a seven-year-old talking about cloaking craft. I was levitated out of bed to a spaceship with three legs. There are grey aliens, some are small and some are tall. On Mars, I learned to look through walls. I can still do this at times. I don't learn anything we learn on Earth. I finished magic school. It's mostly science. I learned about time, space, and gravity. Time controls everything. Time controls all. There is life on Mars, and there's been life on Mars, and a Mars-Earth connection. There are bases there. 
Now this is coming from a seven-year-old girl. I'm going to keep an eye on the time here because I'm running out here. Okay, I'm going to speed this up just to give you a little bit more. Um, one of the fascinating things with this particular account is it, it was a young lady and this is what she's saying, my daughter Fern had experience with ETs, saw this symbol repeatedly and wanted to know what it meant. She saw it on the spacecraft and, and she said to me, I'd love to know your thoughts. What I did was write with the other gentleman, Edward, whose daughter, Alice, was seven, and also talked about going to Mars. And I said, look, I said, would you show this to Alice and ask her if she understands it or she can make anything of it? What was fascinating was, this is what she said. She'd seen it herself on the spacecraft too. And it's, it meant, we found you, we're tracking you, and we'll continue to come and get you. Then, and then said, I'm not sure all, what all this means. In other words, if a person sees this, it's a sign that you've made contact, although there's a higher meaning. So there are two young girls, both the same age, in different parts of the US, never spoken to one another, but both recognize this particular sign. I'm, I'm sorry you can't see it all that well. Um, the script is again from this young lady. Here's another one with a five-year-old describing her uh, 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 spacecraft. There she's showing you the being up here. With, you can see the archetypal being. This one here is the little hybrid little girl. She said she's, she's, half, uh, she's half alien, half, half girl, half special friend. The color of her hair is light and she has thin hair. And that's a boy, she said, over here, um, in this thing here. That's a little boy, she said, that's jumping so he can look out the windows but he's not tall enough. She said, the special friend has a hybrid body, her hair and her head is not as thick as hers, and her home is cold, and everyone, uh, and everyone is leaving, and Mars is now their new home. So she's even describing the situation of the hybrid girl that's a half special friend. I'm nearly there. The daughter explains that um, the, the boy is a special friend that comes through the window. It doesn't matter if the window is open or closed. He comes in when we're in our bunk beds. So I said, well, why did he come to see her? And she said, he's telling me all about your baby. It's a baby boy that will come in your tummy soon. The being comes at night and he's telling me all about outer space. She said, I woke up in the night and I thought, I heard footsteps. And then I just went back to sleep. And I thought, I thought it was you, mum and dad. But I saw a white foot, so I said, don't be afraid, I'm a nice person. I'm sorry I scared you. I said it so they wouldn't be afraid of me. <laughs> completely different, completely different. So here we've got, my past life was an Orion, I was a light physicist working on time travel technology. And the interesting thing about this young man is I was talking to his father over Skype and, and his father's had incredible experiences. And his son, who was nine at the time, said, can I speak to Mary? And I was a bit taken aback. Um, and, I, and his father said, well, of course, you know. So I said, well, why is it that you want, would like to speak to me? And he said, oh, well, it's because of your frequency. So I thought, okay. So this is what we have to understand too, is they're seeing beyond your form, they're seeing you, they're really seeing you. And he continued to explain to me the problem with this planet is that the scientists here are really so backward and um, he can't possibly explain how he understands reality and his understanding as a light physicist because at the moment the only one that got close to it was Nikola Tes Tesla. So he said that's his problem and that's why he said the schools are useless here. He said because you know, they just haven't got any idea. This is a nine-year-old telling me this. Okay, so here we've got something else and I'm gonna really slip through this now because I know we're getting close. A young man, 11-year-old in Western Australia, is now actually connecting to his ET friends and he is bringing through information on the piano from them. And he knew the titles of this music that he was bringing through bef um, before he actually played them. And I'm going to give you the titles here. One is in, um, Insanity, the other one's Decoding Human DNA. One's Learning, another one's Meditation, Going Within Yourself and Arrival. And he goes and he knows when he's going to connect with this being and he brings through the frequencies. Now, another lady that I'm going to have to go really fast with now because I know we're, we're, we haven't got much time, um, but I asked this particular lady because she also 
does the, did the same thing. Juliana Oka has written a book on, of her own called um, One Life, Many Worlds. She's had all the matrix of experiences near death, out of body, other world experiences. She had these experiences in post-war Japan. And she said, my alien experiences happened as a child and went beyond. I was also taken over and I felt something similar to Arthur. It's amazing I received, but I was drained afterwards. Definitely Arthur's been contacted. And she found his compositions as a professional musician were amazing. So the children, again, are bringing in it through their voice, through music, through art. There are many different ways. And this is Juliana playing um, some of her music that she was in inspired through her experiences as well. So it's coming through music, it's coming through language, it's coming through art, it's coming in all different ways, crop circles, frequencies hitting this planet. It's in many, many ways. And we've got the healers like Kathy, who at nine years old speaks three star languages and says that she can heal water. And she does it through one of her frequencies. So again, we know with Masaru Moto and what have you, that if we have the right intent or we use prayer, or we um, uh, even music can actually alter the nature of uh, water itself. And remember, we are what? 50, 60, 70 percent water. So we're getting it too. And, and, and this is what Dr. Olson says, who, who talks a lot about energizing water. She said, healing works on a cellular level, whether you believe it or not. The healing from my hands affected the protein binding to the gene P53, which plays a role in turning genes on and off. So she's there explaining to you. And one of the things she was taught was using crystals. And many of you, I'm sure, here have known about the uh, amazing way you can work with crystals and how they will um, assist you with the frequencies. She was taught this by the beings how to use the crystals, and she teaches others how to do it now. And Dr. Harry Oldfield has certain technologies where you can actually see energies leaving crystals when someone is doing healing through his PIP technology. Healing techniques were taught by her non-visible friends to enhance and direct energy, and how to leave her body to go into her clients and feel the problem. There are many healers that can do this now. I can do the same, connect to their past lives, into their present and cause an any imbalance and I can fix the problem. She's, so she's explaining how she does it. I'm having to go through these pretty fast. One of the other things that I want to show you is the decoders. This seven-year-old was shown these pretty pictures that his mother was looking at and she said to him, what do you make of these pretty pictures, which were Tracy Taylor's? And he came out with this. He said they're from the aliens. And he said they, they contain information Images of harvesters of energy, machines that harvest the sun's energy. There are different types. There are other pictures that contain information. One is about the seven who will be coming. They are eagle people, cat lion people, and they have ancient messages. So here is a child that's able at seven to decode these messages. And also she asked, and how is it? Great. And how is it that you understand them? In, and what he said was, they will. This is how they come. How they will land and arrive. It's a teleportation machine. He's talking about the pyramids. The big pyramid isn't the only one. There are others. They will come in the pyramids and fly over the ground to the south and north pole by way of a teleporter and fly down through the pyramids again. So he's talking about portals all around the planet. And we even have a Russian documentary where this gentleman, an astrophysicist, is talking about portals on the Earth in Alaska, Alaska and Antarctica. I'm sorry I'm going through these a bit fast now. So here we have it. We've got um, these new children coming in. They're coming in with the awareness that we need to break down the paradigm. They're talking about who built the Sphinx, for example, they, they, to tell people in the future that extraterrestrials are real. School programs are like a virus. We're infected with this virus and it extinguishes our light. They, the teachers just program you, as she was saying to me. There are lots of moons. There are artificial ones around Saturn and Jupiter. And people are affected by them. This is what the children are coming out with. They're telling us what's going on. So let's see where we're going. I'm not quite sure. I'm, I'm going to have to go through very fast. So we're being activated. We're being activated now by multiple ways, and one of the most primary is our ancestors, our star, our star family. So what we have to understand now is, is that um, the resonance and frequency, both from space and DNA, are 
three-dimensional configurations so the dormant genes in the so-called junk DNA are aligning. It's like time-activated evolutionary step controlled by the DNA. The DNA being the crystalline form formation with encoded messages aimed to speed up evolution. The biocontainer is one of three parts <coughs> influenced by the other two, mind and soul. The soul is the energy container which moves from body to body between lives, dimensions and worlds with frequencies that have a huge impact on DNA. The soul provides the life force and the data bank and the main control sends frequencies, signals, program photons, electrons, gamma rays to help you carry on your mission and evolve. And not everyone will choose to upgrade. There will be high frequency people and low frequency people and your lifestyle will either enhance or lower it. So here we go. We have got this awakening now to our cosmic heritage. And I'm going to take this to you now. Okay, Tesla says that we need to study non-physical phenomena. It will make a more progress in one decade in all the previous centuries of existence. So I'm going to finish with this. <coughs> this is what the 12-year-old said to his father. Humanity's been at this point three times, but we've been knocked off course. This time, there is a 95% chance we will make it, and possibly a 100% chance we're headed to a higher level. It's due to the shift that's affecting everyone. It's the star seeds and indigos of the planet like us. Gaia cherishes us because we can help the vibration of the planet more than any others. And I wanted to leave this with this beautiful um, comment from a beautiful little eight-year-old in Queensland and I know the grandma very well who's a, a wonderful lady and she wrote this and told me that her, her granddaughter said to her you don't have to worry Nana because they're guiding us home and I think they are. Thank you.